Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Chris Brown, as always, and today is our first day of Trans Week here on the show. And now, for those who are wondering why we're doing this, is we want to give space for people to have a conversation about certain issues that are, are happening across this province and around the world. And we want to know more about trans rights issues and we thought why not have a full week of guests coming on the show to talk about that so in our inaugural episode of trans week it's anna murphy anna thank you so much for doing this greatly appreciate it thank you so much for having me chris i'm so excited for the conversation tonight i am as well um let's start right from the beginning from your perspective, what does being trans mean? Well, speaking for myself personally, being trans meant that when I woke up in the morning, went into the bathroom, looked in the mirror, there was a disconnect between what was being reflected back to me and what I knew deep down in my truest of hearts and my purest of souls to be who I was as an individual, which is that what was being reflected to me was an image of masculinity. Um, but inside and who I knew myself to be was not masculine. It was female. It was feminine. It was a woman. And so for me personally, what it was, what it means to be trans is that I then began to transition and affirm myself in who I am to the outside world, to myself um, as, a, as a woman. Um, and so essentially being trans is a journey. Um, it's a journey that looks different for everybody. Um, but for me personally, it was that what I knew to be deep down inside of who I am didn't match what I was assigned at birth, and it didn't match what was physically being reflected back to me. Now, over the next half hour, 40 minutes, um, and we did, I did talk to Anna before this interview started in our pre-interview. I might ask stupid questions because I'm trying to learn. I, I am a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but I still need to learn. I need to still sit down with people who are not me because I am. I can pass as a straight white male and that is privilege in a, the most privileged way. So I want to sit down and I want to have the hard discussions and hard conversations and ask the questions that I want to know, because the only way I can educate myself is to have people like yourself, Anna, on the show. So, and I've said this at the beginning, but I want to let the listeners know as well. I might ask a stupid question. So I do apologize if it comes off insensitive, but I want to learn and I want you to take me through the journey because I have five great, uh, five great uh, people on the show this week we're going to talk about this and I want to make sure that I do this right and I don't screw it up. So I, I do appreciate you even sitting here for the next 45 minutes and talking about this. It's a privilege. It, uh, you know, and we covered this in, in the, in the pre-interview, the, the preamble before getting into the interview, there are no, you know, stupid questions, um, but not everyone is necessarily, you know, an advocate. Um, not, some folks are just trying to go about their lives. So by us, you and me having this conversation, by the folks who are listening or viewing it, watching it, they'll be able to, you know, some of the questions you may have, maybe what others have, but they don't want to, the, the, they're, and approaching it from a place of, of genuine wanting to know, to do better, to, to create greater equity in our world, that's not a bad conversation to have. So. I'm, I'm, I'm an open book for <laughs> awesome. I am as well. So let's start with the first question I have. Yeah. At what point in time, when did you realize your outsides didn't match your insides? 
very early on. Um, so I grew up in rural Alberta, um, grew up in the, the Wainwright Bonneville area of Alberta. So as anyone who is remotely familiar with kind of the geographical and, you know, societal makeup of, of this great province of ours, it's a very small community. And so the mindset is not necessarily as, as broad and as open, or at least back then it wasn't. Um, but I knew early on, and when I say early on, I can, I can recall and recollect being, you know, five years old and, you know, having this very strong, um, pull towards, you know, being feminine, whether that was, you know, taking on a more feminine role in, you know, playing in the schoolyard and playing, you know, make believe, um, always wanting to be, always wanting to be the, the girl, always wanting to be the, the femme um, identified individual. Um, obviously at, you know, the age of five and six and those early years, um, I didn't, there wasn't the terminology for it. Um, the, 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 we hadn't gotten to where we are now. Um, so it just, it wasn't there. Um, the language wasn't there. Um, and so then fast forward a couple of years to when I was 12 years old was really when I, you know, clear as day can recall the first time that I, uh, came out to someone. It was at a New Year's Eve party. We were at a family friend's and uh, we, the the kids were downstairs, adults were upstairs and me and the child of our family friend, we were sitting and we were just, you know, having a conversation. And I very clearly said in the course of the conversation that when I get older, I am going to have a surgery and be a woman. The, let's be quite clear. No one put that into my head. There was no media out there that was influencing my decision. Um, the language wasn't there. To be quite frank, I didn't even know that that was actually a thing. Like at 12 years old, I didn't actually know that that was a thing. I was just, you know, really grasping at straws. Um, so from you know five until 12 i i knew that there was something different um about me and then you know obviously um continuing to grow up um i like to say i came out in stages i started as coming out as bisexual um because i thought that that would be an easier um pill for my father who is your very typical um alberta guy works in oil and gas semi-professional team roper work you know has a ranch the horses the whole nine yards very typical alberta so i thought you know what maybe if i came out as bisexual that will be easier then you know a couple of years later that was probably at about you know 14 15 at about 16 i came out as gay that label really didn't fit um because it was like, okay, yes, I'm attracted to men, but it's not about an, it's not about attraction. It's not about who I'm attracted to. It's about who I am. There, there is something that the, there's a disconnect and who I am and who I know on the inside is not, again, not what I'm seeing on the outside. So it wasn't until um, 18 when I, you know, first moved out, moved away from home. And as most people do when they move away from home and they go off to, to college or whatever it is that they do, you start to come into your own, you start to learn more about yourself. And so at 18 was when I started to look more into it because I knew that there just, there something was still not fitting. It wasn't about being gay. It wasn't about being bi. Um, so I started looking into it. I started researching, which at that time, you know, putting into, you know, a search engine, um, you know, I think I put, you know, a search along the lines of, I feel like I'm a woman and I'm a guy or something along those lines. You can only imagine the kind of rabbit hole that, you know, I fell down and the type of 
very derogatory terminology, um, very outdated terminology now um, that was there. But what was there and what I eventually did find through my own, you know, looking into it and, you know, self-discovery was transgender and going through and reading it on my own. And it wasn't a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? It wasn't a sensationalized um, article or anything like that. It literally was, it was a medical journal um, that I was, that I was reading. It was medical, um, it was medical documents that I was reading that defined what transgender was. Um, and I started going through it and it was like all the, all the check marks just started being ticked off. So at 18, I then, you know, started to, started to trans, started the, the journey of transitioning. Um, and one of the first stops was to my psychologist and my doctor. Um, because when I first came out, the first person I came out to was my grandmother. And uh, through the help of a really good friend at that time, um, that friend organized a lunch where I came to the lunch as me, as what you see now. Um, well, maybe a little bit, you know, maybe a little less um, affirmed in who I am than I am now. Um, but essentially I went to that lunch presenting as Anna. Um, and my friend was there for support. My grandmother and my grandfather were there. And I essentially said, I'm a girl and I want to be a girl. And after that lunch got done, um, before my grandma got in the car, she turned to me and she said, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this right. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. And what she meant by that was that we needed to speak to the professionals. So that included um, a psychologist, my psychologist, who I had, uh, who I had been seeing for, you know, for quite some time, who I had a history with, um, along as with, uh, you know, family doctors. Um, and, you know, she didn't say it in, uh, it, it, she didn't mean it to be malicious. What she meant by that was, okay, you know, this is something that she's unfamiliar with, I'm unfamiliar with. So we need to go to the folks who can help us guide and navigate what this is going to look like. And the rest is history, which I'm sure we will get into more in this conversation. We certainly will. But first, we always got to start with the past because you talked a lot about uh, moments in your life. And I want to talk about them, if that's OK with you. Let's start with growing up in rural Alberta. Wainwright, Bonneville, let's be honest, probably not, not the most progressive areas in the province. Nothing dissing them. I think they're great communities. I had the pleasure of covering Wainwright City Council as a reporter in Lloydminster. I covered Bonneville when I was in Lloydminster as well. Great community with great people. But being different in rural Alberta has got to be hard. During the moment, the years from five to 18, when you moved away, was it hard? Was it hard to try to come to terms with a massive change in your life when you don't have the resources, you don't have the uh, outreach that you would in a larger urban center, say like Edmonton or Calgary? 100%. So if we go back, you know, I mean, this is almost a decade, um, well, over a decade, I guess now, um, there wasn't as much advocacy for access to quality affirming healthcare as we see now. 
granted that we still have work to do on on that file but when you go back when you roll the tape back you know a decade or so ago it was even more harder to access so there like i said i didn't have the terminology um it just it wasn't something that was talked about even being gay or lesbian wasn't necessarily something that was talked about in the most affirming of ways, let's just say. I can remember, um, you know, being in grade six, you know, just entering middle school and being harassed and tormented relentlessly for being gay and being called, trigger warning to anyone who's listening or watching, being called a faggot and all of, you know, being called a queer. Um, this was before queer was, you know, being starting to be reclaimed. This was when queer was still very much derogatory. And as a, you know, 12, 13 year old, you know, just getting into middle school, grade six. Um, at this time, I had also just moved into, you know, into, into a new school, into a new community, Bonneville. Um, and so I didn't know, I didn't know what I was being tormented and harassed for. Um, that wasn't even something I had said that I was at, at that point. I didn't start to come out um, until, you know, a couple of years later. And even then, I, again, as I said, came out in stages, bisexual, then gay. Those labels didn't fit. So then I found a label that did, which was transgender. Um, but it was incredibly hard. Um, like I said, you know, my father, incredible man, truly the greatest man that I probably will ever know, um, despite us not having a relationship. Um, but, you know, he was your typical, it was a very typical rural Alberta upbringing. My father was going to, you know, team roping jackpots and, you know, small community rodeos because he was a team roper. Um, I, we lived on a ranch, um, so horses and cattle and all of that lifestyle. Um, so being different was was a challenge. It was very, it was very isolating. Um, it was very lonely um, to to pretty much feel like you were you were the black sheep everywhere you went. And so even at eighteen, um, I mean, I had moved away. Let's be clear, I didn't move away to some big huge center. I moved out kind of in stages. I moved first to Vermilion because I thought that, you know, going to college at all, like I thought going to college, no matter what college, you would have this experience of being around diversity and, you know, different ideas and thoughts and old college or not old college, sorry. Lakeland. Lakeland. Thank you. Um, again, great educational institution. They have phenomenal agricultural programming. Um, it, it really wasn't, it, it was kind of a bit of a, of, a, of a frying pan in the face when I walked in on registration day and it was, it, it was not what I was expecting. I was, so it was like, ooh, well, okay. Um, and so then, you know, then I dropped out of uh, college because the uh, my mental health was not all that great um, and the pressure of you know trying to fit in in again it was like trying to fit a, a circular knob into a square uh, hole and it just it, it was not working so my mental health um, declined um, was again trigger warning suicidal um, ended up in the you know vermilion um, hospital emergency room um, for self-harm activities. So then I moved to Lloydminster, which is not much better for diversity and equity. I'm and not, I apologize. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing <laughs> no, at you moved to Lloydminster. Don't get me wrong. I lived there for two and a half years of my life. And I, I, I lived there for two and a half years of my life. And that's the end of that yeah. story for Chris Brown. Exactly. But, you know, and, and you said it, Chris, you said it perfectly. Like it, it, this is not a slight against, you know, Wainwright, Vermilion, Lloyd Minster, Bonneville. It just, especially at this point in time, 
the narrative wasn't where it is now. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, I know, you know, that youth who are growing up in rural Alberta today still face immense adversity and challenge and barriers. Um, but again, let's roll the clock back a decade and let's amplify those barriers um, a little bit. So from Vermilion, which was when I, you know, that's where I came out to, to my grandmother. Um, that's where I started to, you know, affirm myself. I started to present um, feminine as the, the terminology, which I think is actually still the medical terminology that's used. I started to live full time. Um, and what essentially that means is that I, when I woke up in the morning, when I walked out the door, I walked out as a woman. Um, I dressed as a woman, um, not necessarily very, again, old, gross, outdated term, maybe not very passably, um, but I started to live full time and it was in Vermilion. So that, you know, that came with its own set of challenges. Then I moved to Edmonton. So <clears throat> yes, it was challenging. It, it was because the healthcare and the resources and the supports weren't there. And to, even though I don't live in rural Alberta anymore, I know from conversations I've had, they still aren't necessarily there. Um, and so the access to quality affirming care and resources is so important. So it wasn't until, you know, 1819, when I moved to Edmonton, that I started to really be able to receive or have access to, to care. Um, but again, got met with what is, and largely still is, a system of antiquated gatekeeping um, that is trans healthcare. Um, whether that, and that's not even necessarily, like trans healthcare, you know, to be clear, isn't also just about surgery. There's a lot more that goes into it. Um, there is access to a psychologist or a social worker or a counselor that can help to, you know, th that, that can help you work through what it is that you are experiencing to work through the, the mental health aspect of it. There is, you know, access to medication. Um, if you go down that road, not every trans person does, um, and it doesn't invalidate them in any way, shape or form. Um, but even then, there are, there's so much gatekeeping. There's so many hoops that you have to jump through. And unfortunately, in trying to jump through those hoops, um, the difficulty manifested itself in, as I mentioned, self-harm behavior, um, suicide attempts, um, with one coming very close to being successful. One very cold evening in Edmonton, I found my way onto the high-level bridge, onto a side of the high level bridge that you really don't want to find yourself on. Um, it resulted in having challenges keeping a job down, whether that was from being met with barriers to being hired, because again, I didn't look passable in their eyes, or I would get hired, but my mental health was not being managed properly and having to self advocate at every stage. So yeah, from the time yeah, through growing up all the way from all the way up until about 1819, it was a challenge. It, it was a challenge. So I don't want to put you in an awkward position to answer something that you don't want to. But if, if you feel comfortable answering this question, please. Do. I said I'm an open book, Chris. I know, but I, I always, as, as the host, I always feel like I'm always going to ask the inappropriate question. During the time from five to 18, when you were discovering who Anna was, did you do the traditional, and I say that is sort of ironically, but the traditional put down of other LGBTQ members? Because when I was coming out, I remember in high school that I heard the word gay and people would make fun of it. And to try to hide the fact that I was, I would say, oh yeah, that effing fag or that, oh, that queer bait or whatever. And I would be part of the, the attacks on myself in some sense, because 
I wanted to make sure that I didn't get beat up. So I would make sure that I hung around people or said things that would not bring attention to myself. So as someone in the, who was transitioning at that time, who was discovering themselves, did you find yourself doing that as well? I didn't, um, I didn't get involved in, you know, um, putting down or, or, you know, projecting um, kind of that internalized transphobia or homophobia. But what I did do is, and this is again why I say I came out in stages, at, when I came out as bisexual, I, you know, had a girlfriend, even though I wasn't really attracted to girls all that much at that time. Like, I mean, again, let's be quite clear, this was like 13, 14. So, I mean, you know, take girlfriend with a grain of salt. Um, but even at, um, you know, 15, 16, I had another girlfriend. Um, and again, this is partly why, A, I'm like, okay, bisexual doesn't fit. Like there really actually isn't any attraction whatsoever to women. It just, it was like, yeah, this just really, so that's why I came out as gay. Um, but then I was like, but it's not about attraction. Like it's not about, yes, you know, I'm attracted to men, but for all intents and purposes, I'm technically then a straight woman. I'm a straight trans woman, but I'm a woman who's attracted to men. So technically I'm straight. Um, that probably just blew a few minds, but anyways, we'll-, we'll... Well, it was a question I was going to ask later on, but you just answered it. So I, I don't have say, to ask that question anymore. I was going to say, we'll, uh, we'll work through that. Um, and really it just comes down to trans women are women, a woman who's attracted to a man. Your orientation then is, if you guessed straight folks, you would be correct. Um, so that's why I was like, well, yeah, like gay, it's not the right label. Um, so I was like, so for a period there, I'm like, I really don't. I'm like, so does this mean that like I'd be a gay, effeminate, like guy, like a, I guess to, to use the lingo that kids use now, I guess like, so do I be a twink? Like, is that like, do I be this really hyper feminine gay guy, um, you know? And, you know, but I was like, but, if I have kids or a family, I want to be a mom. Like that was another big thing. I wanted, like, if I had kids, I wanted to be the mom. I wanted my kids to call me mom. And I was trying to figure out all these ways. So again, that's kind of what led me to, I'm like, there's just, there's something. And again, looking in the mirror back to that fundamental thing. When I woke up in the morning and looked in the mirror, I'm like, there's just something not right. I don't know what it is, but there's just, there's something not right. And not even, you know, looking in the mirror, but having this very strong disconnect physically with, at that time, the way that my body was physically um, and just not being like, it just, yeah, it was like, there's something not, the, the, there's something here. I have no idea what it is because I didn't have the terminology. Um, so I didn't, again, I didn't get into that sense of projecting um this internalized homophobia. homophobia transphobia by engaging in vitriol towards those who were different also to be quite clear in you know places like bonneville and wainwright it's not like there was a whole lot of people to do that i was the one that was getting it so really there was no other there was no one else for me to like jump on board and be like hey yeah you're making fun of that person Sure, I'll, uh, you know, to, to save social status in middle school and high school, I'll, no, I was, I was the target. Um, I can remember, like, a target to the point, I can remember, you know, sitting in the hallway at lunch and someone threw an orange at the back of my head, like, that's just the type of target that I was. I was, in terms of totem pole, I was the bottom of it. There, there was no one else to, um, so, but again, I tried to... I tried to fit in. I, I you know, I, I, I did the best I could. Um, I tried to have my dad teach me to team rope. That ended poorly. That ended great guy, great team roper, bad teacher. 
Um, that just, it didn't do us any favors. Um, my but opinion, I, all fathers are bad teachers at the end of the day, because I'm pretty sure I don't remember anything my father taught me as well. <laughs> they're just very, they're set in their ways, fathers. They're just, they're very set in their ways. And so them trying to teach someone to, they get frustrated and then you get frustrated and it just, nobody was happy. Um, but I loved horseback riding. I loved being around horses. Um, I, I loved horseback riding and enjoyed going to the rodeos and watching my dad, you know, compete. I loved watching barrel racers, um, should come as no shock. I loved the rodeo royalty, um, uh, the, the rodeo queens and the princesses. Um, so like I tried, I rode quads. Um, I did, you know, we had skidoos, um, like I, I did everything I could to to fit in as best I could into this mold, this that, you know, was was there. But again, it was like trying to fit a, a circular knob through a square hole. It just it wasn't working. And again, that's not to say that women don't ride skidoos and quads and do all that stuff. They do. Absolutely. They do. But I wasn't necessarily like I was trying to do everything I could to, yeah, just be, just be normal, really, as much as I could. But no matter what I did, this deep down feeling inside, that's why I say, you know, in my, you know, truest of hearts and in my deepest soul, I, I always knew. And again, you know, I go back to, you know, at five, um, you know, having this idea, you know, and it wasn't even just, you know, through role playing or wanting to play with Barbies or dress up. There was a, there was, um, th there was an incident when I was about, oh, probably about 10 or 11, um, where, uh, you know, where my, dad's girlfriend caught me in the bathroom trying to self mutilate myself in, you know, in my lower area, let's just say. Um, and that was just because I didn't want to be a boy. I wasn't a boy. Um, but again, through that, like that, you know, Nowadays, you know, if if that, you know, were to happen, at least, you know, here in, in Calgary or, or in Edmonton in a bigger center, you know, the parents would take the child in, they would, you know, they would perhaps get seen by, you know, psychiatric, and they would probably start prompting the question, you know, not necessarily prompting as in putting words in their mouths, but, you know, helping to navigate the, the kiddo through hey, like, what's, like, what's going on? Like, do you feel this or helping to navigate? I didn't get that. Um, essentially, I got, I got labeled as, yeah, as, again, the black sheep, as someone who was just engaging in self-harm, an attention seeker. Um, and that's, at the end of the day, that's not what it was about at all. I'm not sure if I'm going to use the correct terminology here. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but Okay. Anna was not. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to screw up this question royally. So to my listeners, if you're going to send me hate mail, I apologize right now, but please just send it to me and I'll file it away in an appropriate location. Don't send Chris hate mail. He's doing <laughs> oh, I get it all the time. Don't worry. I get it all the time. You should have seen the stuff that came to me after the cancer diagnosis came out. So oh. um, yeah, people need to get the, some serious like hobbies. And you were, you were not officially, you were not officially born Anna. Anna came along later. Anna was around when you officially accepted yourself and became Anna. I identify you as Anna. That is who I will always identify you as. Where did Anna come from? The name Anna, because I don't know how to say the dead name? How did you transition from the dead name to Anna? <laughs> does that um, make sense? <laughs> it does. No, it does. It's okay. A, it's a, oh, it's a, it's a good, yeah, no, it's a good way of framing that. I mean, essentially it's like, yeah, how did you, how did you decide on Anna? Um, and actually, and also, you know, just to touch on that, you know, Anna, Anna was always there. 
it's just Anna okay. wasn't yeah Anna just what Anna wasn't always affirmed and Anna wasn't always the one going out into the world um when I opened the door so I had to get to a point where like Anna has always like I have always the woman inside me I guess um to put it that way the woman's always been there the girl's always been there um she just maybe didn't necessarily have the best way of she just wasn't always affirmed in 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 who she was um she didn't always have the resources to be affirmed in who she was or the the safe and welcoming space to 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 do so um but in terms of the name um so my full name so when i um and this was also this really was the kind of one of the final nails in the coffin of the relationship between me and my dad um so i was in edmonton and i had been living full time as me for an extended period of time um and i was still using my dead name and it just it it, it was very it was a mind fuck let's put it that way apologies insert the the beep there oh we don't do um, that on this show politicians oh, do it all the time it's all good swear okay. as much as you want Love it. um so it, it was it, it, it was it was a bit of a mind fuck because i had i had started you know i had done pretty much everything else to affirm who i was in the world when i woke up i you know i i dressed as a woman i talked well, as best I could as a woman, I guess, you know, mannerisms, et cetera, et cetera. I had started to affirm pretty much every aspect of my life as, as a female, except I was still using my dead name. And someone had brought it up and mentioned it. And they're like, so when are you going to change your name? And I was like, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. And then I did start thinking about it. And so I started looking to women whom I admired, um, women who throughout uh, my life, I had looked to as role models, women who in those times when I was so deep in, you know, a, a mental darkness that there wasn't really a light that I would, you know, either draw inspiration from or, or strength from their story or, or who they were. Um, one of them was Princess Diana. Another one was Anna Winter. Another one was Reba McIntyre. And then another one was my friend who actually helped to facilitate that lunch where I first came out to a family member. And her name was Diane Woodman. And then just as a little side tangent, um, in later years, I have also reflected on, um, and there is one woman who I should have also been contemplating, and that's my grandmother, Irene. Um, but at that time, I, yeah, I, I hadn't um, taken her name into account. Now I have. Um, I'm not changing my name again only because a it costs way too damn much money and it's just, it is such a a ridiculous process i'm not doing it um but if i have a child anyways total tangent so i looked at the women that i you know admired idolized role model whatever you want to call it and so i landed on the first name Diane with two N's because then I would have Anne in my name. So kind of a nod to Anna. Um, and it would be an encompassing of Diane, my friend, Princess Diana. Um, and then for my middle name, I chose Jacqueline um, to honor Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, so it was kind of a, a culmination. And so I then, you know, went on to Facebook and I said, you know, I did a, a, 
a, a status update essentially. And I said, you know, pretty much call me, call me Diane, essentially. Like I used my full legal name. It didn't go over so well with my father. Um, yeah, there was, there were some not so great and, and remarkable text messages that were sent back and forth on that one. Um, and so, so yes, that's how I kind of sort of came into and, and, um, re renamed myself as I guess. So um, your, your official name then is Diana? Is Diane. So Diane. So then friends of mine, um, we were having, we were having dinner one night and these two really remarkable friends of mine from up in Edmonton, um, we got done dinner and uh, they were leaving and we were saying goodbye. And they turned to me and they're like, you know, Diane just doesn't, it's too formal. It's too stuffy for you. They're like, you know, and also you are way more like on a winter than you give yourself credit for. So we're just going to call you Anna. And I'm like, okay. I can live with that. It, it, it kind of fits. It's kind of a nickname. It's a nickname of my full name. Um, and so, but they called me it so regularly, especially like when we were out in public, um, one of the friends I worked with. So it just, Anna just really stuck. The abbreviation just really stuck. And I used it regularly. I was comfortable using it. Um, but I never wanted, and some people have been like, well, why didn't you change it and all that? I'm like, because I still feel connected to Diane. Um, and the reason why I initially chose it. Um, and to be fair, that's why I did the long spelling of Diane with two N's so that Anne is in there. Um, so Anne is not a far stretch. Um, but yes, when people, I mean, I'm sure, you know, folks who know me that watch this will probably be like, oh my God, I didn't even know because I only really ever use Diane on anything legal. So when I go into the hospital or, you know, going for a doctor's appointment or pick up a prescription, it has my full legal name, but Anna has just stuck. Um, largely thanks to those two friends from Edmonton that, you know, also again, helped to affirm the journey. Um, so yeah, so that's where Anna, Diane, and that's, that's where I came from. That's where the naming process came from. Um, I am, uh, I'm, I am always flabbergasted when I come into an interview and I'm expecting it to go one way and expect to have like me fumbling over questions. But this has been, this, I, we're not even done yet. Please, please know that people who are listening and watching, as you probably see, there's still time left on the scroll bar because I am... I'm so happy. And this is my, this, this, this is the first interview I've done for the week. I am so happy I did this because I'm learning so much. And I, I, like I, Anna, Diane, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. I want to turn for a second to the dark day. Which the dark, one? The, the day you were on the Edmonton Bridge. I'm assuming there's probably more as well, but we'll talk about those. That's you... why, see, I mean, at least I can laugh about it now. Um, yeah. That's why I'm like, which one? There's been a few of them, but yeah, that would, that would, that would be the, probably the darkest. So let's yeah. talk about that darkest day. Yeah. I'm going to just come out with the, the one word question here. Why? Oh, well, <clears throat> so at that point, um, I had been living in Edmonton um, in outpatient treatment for an eating disorder. Um, my uh, doctor at the eating disorder clinic in Edmonton recognized that Vermilion wasn't, or well, Vermilion and Lloydminster weren't necessarily the best places for me to be but I couldn't afford to move to Edmonton. Um, I had also started losing um, a significant amount of weight 
um, again and engaging in in um, in eating disorder behavior. So, anyways, admitted me into outpatient treatment. So that's how I came to be in Edmonton. Um, and so <clears throat> was doing outpatient treatment through the outpatient residence at the University of Alberta Hospital. Um, and it was just, it was a, um, a, a night. I got a pass to, to essentially have the night off the unit. Um, so I could take my meals wherever I wanted to. Um, and I thought, you know what? I want to go out. I want to go out for dinner. Um, and I thought, well, I don't have anyone to go out with. Like, I don't have a friend to go out with. At that point in time, all of my friends were eating disorder patients on an eating disorder ward. So it's not like, you know, we were going out to restaurants very frequently. Um, so I'm like, well, where can I go that I would be okay to be by myself, being a trans woman, um, still dealing with um, a five o'clock shadow, um, you know, being, you know, some being worried about being clocked essentially by someone and the potential harm and risk that that could, could put me in. So I thought, you know, so I kind of sort of started looking and I'm like, oh, well, why not? I mean, surely, surely a, a, a gay bar would be okay. And at that time in Edmonton, there was a, an establishment called Buddies and Buddies had a club underneath, but then it also had um, kind of like a, a, like a, a pool hall kind of a, they served pub food essentially. So I went up to the upstairs of, of Buddies and, you know, ordered some chicken strips and, uh, and you know, a, a, a drink and just sat there. I just, I sat at the bar because um, I thought, well, you know, I'll look, I'll look less, you know, lonely and pathetic if I at least sit up at the bar, then at least maybe I can engage in conversation with the bartender. Um, and I didn't engage in conversation with the bartender. This, no offense, Chris, this cisgendered gay man came over and, and sat beside me. And he was just sitting there. Like I kind I didn't really pay him any mind for the majority of it. I went about my business of eating dinner and, you know, just this, to be clear, this was the first time that I had really gone out. Like, yes, I had been, you know, dressing as a woman, affirming myself, but this was the first time I went and like sat in public extended period of time. Um, like this was the first night that I kind of built up that courage to be like, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to worry about, am I androgynous enough? Or I'm just, I'm just going to go out as me. And so I was just sitting there, you know, focusing on that, dealing with the immense anxiety I had for, you know, being out as who I was also dealing with the immense anxiety of, you know, trying to get through this, these chicken nuggets, um, essentially. Um, and the guy turned to me and said, you know, I really don't get what it is that you're doing. And I don't understand why it is that you're doing it. And I looked to him and essentially we then engaged in this individual giving me his unsolicited opinion on my being transgender and him not understanding it and having issue with it. Um, and that was the straw that essentially broke the proverbial camel's back. I finished up my meal, I paid. I then, because where Buddy's was and where the, the U of A is, it was not, too far of a distance. I had a vehicle at this time um, because, you know, uh, was uh, so I had a vehicle. So I got into my car and I drove the, the, the five minutes 
um, or so that it was. I drove across the high level bridge, past the legislature, across the high level bridge. And there's a diner there, the high level diner. And I parked my car in the high level diner. And I took my coat off and I just, I was, I was focused on going across. So I took my coat off. I left it in the car because wouldn't be needing it where I was headed. And I started walking from the high level diner down the sidewalk on the, what would have been the left-hand side of the bridge. And I got to what I thought was, you know, the highest point above water. And I looked out. Um, so that would be on the opposite side of, of the legislature. So I was looking out over, you know, the lights of Edmonton and thinking about an accumulation of adversity, of transphobia, of disownment, of loneliness, of isolation that I had felt. This was a couple nights after my father had essentially texted me in response to my putting my name on Facebook that he would not now, nor would he ever have a daughter. Um, it was at a time when Diane, um, that friend who had helped, we didn't talk as much because I was in Edmonton, she was in Lloydminster, we fell out of touch. Um, there was also a very significant age difference between me and Diane. I've always gotten along with people who are older than me, um, but we had fallen out of touch. Um, again, not blaming her for, for any of this. Um, this is just part of, of, the, of what caused me to get to a point of just being emotionally numb. Um, I thought about the reality of, you know, not having a relationship with my mother. Um, I thought about the, um, I thought about the burden that I was on my grandmother who has, in addition to me transitioning and bearing the load, she has also been right there pretty much every step of the way, helping, assisting, She's been along for the ride and she shouldn't have to be. Um, she's my grandmother, not my parent, but she's been there from day one. So as I was thinking about all of this, um, I also thought about the reality of what it meant for me to be a transgender woman, which at that point essentially meant a couple of different options were before me. I could become a prostitute and sell myself to people who had a kink or a fetishization of, of uh, pre-operative trans women. Um, I could, you know, become another statistic in terms of being houseless, without employment, unable to, you know, afford to pay for the basic necessities. Um, so all of this, and as I thought about it, more and more and more, um, started to cry and came to the very firm realization that I just want to be done. I just want to be over. I just want to cash in my chips and call it a game. Sometimes there's winners and losers in a game, and I had pretty much resigned myself to being a loser in this game. And so throughout all of this, I had climbed over. This was before they had put the, the guardrail protections on the high level bridge, which there are now, um, but there weren't at this point, um, had climbed over and I was hanging on. Um, why I didn't let go, I have no idea because I was on the, the side that you don't want to be on for long enough 
all it would have taken is just a, a little loosening and it would have been over um, for those who, you know, aren't intimately aware with the high level bridge. There's not a lot of space on the ledge. It's not exactly a space that was designed to be hanging out and standing on. So it wouldn't have it, a slight loosening anything would have it would have been the end of it. And essentially the next thing that I remember was I could see lights down below me, which kind of sort of pulled me a bit out of the thought process that I was in because I was because it it struck me as odd that there would be lights in the water. Um, I would come to learn later that I hadn't quite managed to get fully out across um, the bridge over the, I was just on the, 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 the edge. I was almost there, but not quite. And there's a pathway um, that runs along through the Edmonton River Valley and where that was, there's a rec center. And I would come to learn that those lights were the Edmonton Police Service um, because then shortly after um, there were lights coming from behind me. Um, there were Edmonton Police Service officers um, behind me, very calmly talking to me. Um, they came up and essentially said, how's it going tonight? And I kind of sort of turned and I said, not that great. Um, and eventually they got me to, to come across the ledge. Again, I had been out there for, I was cold because this was in around October, November. Um, so October, November, uh, normally in Alberta, save for apparently this, this year. year. Yeah, save, save for this year when apparently October is monsoon season in Calgary. Um, normally in when, you know, there's not the effects of climate change, it's cold. It's very cold. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I've been here for five years. I've never seen it this warm. <laughs> climate change right. is real. <laughs> right um so i was I, I was very cold so they got me across because i had taken my jacket off um and left it in the car so i was out there in oh god i don't even know what i was wearing but it was not exactly designed to be standing out with wind blowing past you in winter in alberta so they got me across and i was just i was just I was frozen. I was so frozen. Um, they got me into the back of, of a car and um, the, 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 the crisis worker, essentially the crisis officer, the officer essentially that's trained um, to, to help in these circumstances was in the car with me and we chatted for a little bit. Um, you know, he asked, you know, well, what's your address? You know, where do you live? And I explained to him and, you know, I was uh, an outpatient for the eating disorder clinic. Um, and then they took me to the U of A. They, because technically I had, you know, I had a patient bracelet. So they just, they took me in to emergency at, at the U of A and dropped me back off there. Um, so that was probably, it. yeah, that was probably the if not one of the the top darkest days um i definitely do con uh uh contemplate on on that even now um when i've gone back up to edmonton or crossing the high level bridge it it, it hits differently um very much hits differently um a few years after that i uh i I had, I had avoided walking across. I had tried to avoid um, anything that would trigger essentially me. So I had avoided walking across the high level, but eventually, you know, a few years later I did, I walked back across and I stopped and I just looked and just reflected on how very close, again, I have to thank, you know, my better angels or whatever is out there because it, yeah it all it would have taken is a loosening or anything and we wouldn't be having this conversation we wouldn't and so 
I, I want to ask a question here. And yeah, yeah. Again, again, I'm not trying to stick on the bees. We'll talk about the good stuff here soon. I promise. I promise we'll talk about life now and all. The, uh, looking back on those those dark days, and that's just one, as you've mentioned, one of the many that you probably have gone through in your life. Looking back, knowing what you know now, if you could talk to that young girl on that ledge because there are people out there right now there are girls and boys out there right now who are in that exact same position not not on that ledge but are thinking tonight i i don't know if i can continue on i don't know how to move on i live in a rural part of this province i live in a rural part of canada my mother and father don't wouldn't wouldn't accept me what would you tell that young Anna? What would you tell that young boy, that young girl right now who are in that exact position? Because at the end of the day, I think, and they're, they're probably not listening to this. And if they are, I, I hope they are, because I really hope they hear what you're about to say. So what would you tell them right now? Oh, I would tell them that you don't know what is up ahead on, on the road of, of life. You don't know, you know, even when you think that you've reached the end of the road, you, you don't know. You don't know if there's a turn. You don't know if there's a fork in the road. Heck, maybe there's a U-turn. Um, and you don't know what you might miss out on. I know the typical response is it gets better. And true, it, it does get better, but Life has challenges. Life has ups and downs. Some are much more harder to deal with and navigate than others. Um, so while yes, it does get better, I, I don't want anyone to think that it gets perfect because it doesn't, it's life. But when you, for someone like myself or really anyone who gets to the point where they just want that pain to end whatever that pain looks like um they just they they just they want some relief um they're tired they're exhausted they're worn out um and you get into this i would tell them that I know what it's like to be surrounded by no matter where you look, life looks like a shit storm. And no matter where you look in that shit storm, because I, I know what, you know, norm the, I know what the, the line is, you know, look for the good in your life, you know, distract yourself. Sometimes folks get to a point where distractions don't work and you're looking for the light and you don't see one. But here's the thing, it's there. It really, honest to God, is there. You can't see it, but it is there. As someone who has been in that shit storm a couple of times, um, at least two that have been quite significant, the most significant one we just talked about, that light is there. Because if it wasn't there, like I said, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But there was a light there. And it did get better. It didn't get perfect. Um, my life did not get perfect. Did not become this wonderful utopia without any issue, without any problem. But what did happen is I found a group of individuals along the way that affirmed who I was and welcomed me and accepted me. And they've helped 
make those challenges or those barriers that life tosses at all of us bearable. And so to, and I hope they're listening too. I hope that, you know, someone, I hope it helps someone because at the end of the day, and specifically to someone who is 2SLGBTQ plus or marginalized, know that I see you, but more importantly, not just me, there are so many incredible individuals who see you, who fight for you, who love you, even though they don't know who you are, and stand beside you, even if they're not physically there or you've never met them, they're there, we're there, I'm there. Um, and together, we can help to get through that shit storm that maybe right now you're looking and you're going, I don't see this light. I don't even see a tiny smidgen of it. And I'm just exhausted. I say, I've been there more than once. I've been there and somehow have managed to, to get through it. Some Times it's been on my own volition and having to, to figure it out. But especially, you know, within the last, you know, at least six years, you know, there have been people along the way. And you don't know what you might miss by not being here. And you being here is worth so much, even if you, again, don't think it does because I've been there. I felt that. I felt, I felt useless. I felt alone. I felt unwanted. I felt all those things that most people who get into this feel. And it's not true. It, it really isn't. It's it's that exhaustion. It's that again. It's that shit storm that you're walking through right now. And you just you need someone to just essentially extend a hand and say, how are you really doing? Um, and for me, I've had those folks. One of them was, you know, one of them was my doctor three years ago, going through immense complications after surgery, what was supposed to be the happiest moment of my life. And it was my doctor who, when I was pretty much back on that ledge, just looked in my eyes and said, how are you really doing? And I'm here for you. So that's what I say is, how are you really? And I'm here for you, but I know that there are so many other remarkable individuals out there who are also there for you. And if we can hold your hand and get you back off that ledge, Again, I wish I could say it gets perfect. I really do. That's not life, unfortunately, but we can walk it together and we can get you back off that ledge. You just mentioned the next subject that I want to talk about, which was surgery. Surgery is one of the, should be the most happiest days of, uh, of someone who is transitioning his life. You are, you are going to come out as a new person and your outsides will match your insides, how, how you've always wanted. Um, if you can, take me through that process of making that final decision, because I'm a very indecisive person. I can't make a decision. I buy something at the store and about five minutes later, I'm going, why the hell did I buy it? Why the heck did I do this? I can't make a decision. My husband laughs at me all the time whenever I buy something or something comes from Amazon because I will send it back within probably two days after it not being open. But making a decision to alter your body to make you feel happy is one of the, I, I will never have that choice to go, like to make that decision. You have. Tell me about that decision to finally say to your doctor, it's time, let's do it. Well, first and foremost, um, every, every individual is unique in 
whether or not they, in, in what their transition medically looks like, not everyone undergoes, heck, not even everyone undergoes hormone replacement therapy. Not everyone undergoes um, uh, uh, gender affirming surgery. Um, and regardless of that, it makes them no less a man, no less a woman, no less a two-spirit individual, no less a gender diverse individual. So just for folks who are listening, who might be like, well, you know, it's not a, it's not a monolith. Not everyone does that. I know that. That's why I just said, and I recognize that, yeah, not everyone goes through surgery. For me though, um, back to me, um, for me personally, and arguably for most, if not all folks who, who do undergo surgery, um, it's life-saving. It really truly is um, because you, you, when you get to the point where you wake up and you see your body for the first time, you kind of have a, oh my God, it's like, it's like when you find that missing piece of a puzzle and you finished the puzzle and you're just, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's what that, yeah, that's how that, that's how that puzzle was supposed to look all this time. That makes sense. Um, but um, for me, from the very beginning, I was very clear with, with my doctor, like it was not a, you know, in the last couple of years in the right out of the gate, I, I, I wanted to, because again, if, you know, you roll back the, the, this interview, you know, people will be able to see that there have been moments in the timeline where I did not connect physically with my body. There was, there, there was a very strong disconnect physically with my body. Um, and so from the get go, I knew that surgery was, was, was my, was the right decision for me. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, um, because of the, again, the antiquated gatekeeping system that is trans healthcare even today. Um, and in fact, that's been recognized by WPATH, which is the international body that oversees healthcare for trans folks, along with the United Nations. So this isn't me just throwing jargon out there, folks, for anyone who might watch this that might want to, you know, re rebute it or, or argue it. This isn't me just spouting some radical ideology it's actually you know anyways that's a whole other tangent um oh let's be honest they're gonna still go on that tangent of themselves no of the, like no, no matter yeah, what we say that someone's gonna have take offense to something so it we live no, in that type of world but continue on Anna. right um so for me getting to that point involved a tremendous amount of doctor's appointments. Um, it required a, well, it, it required years. Like it wasn't a, I woke up one morning and said, hey, you know what? I want surgery. Let's go do this. Yeah, no, it required years. This was a decade. I, I came out, started to transition at 18 um, and I didn't undergo gender affirming surgery until uh, three years, three, four years ago. Uh, so I'm- 2018, so, 2017? Yeah, so 20, yeah, so 2017. So oh. yeah, 2017. So I began transitioning in 2011. So that was about eight years that it took to get to a point where everything was, you know, aligned to that the approvals that the process like the actual medical process and the gatekeeping and the safeguards and the checking all the boxes dotting all of your eyes was done um because you have to there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you got to meet in order to even get to a point where your doctor here in Alberta um, is sending the referral to Alberta Health to be, because here in Alberta, we do cover um, the cost of the surgery. 
Um, I believe, in fact, all provinces across Canada cover it. Um, but Alberta Health has a very, you, even if you're off by a smidgen, there was one moment where we submitted my paperwork for surgery and I was two months out of, because you have to be on hormones. So you have to be on hormone replacement therapy for a year. And I was at the 10 month mark, but my doctor was like, okay, yeah, you, you've only been on hormones for 10 months, but you've been transitioning for like all these years. Like, it's not like this is a new thing. So he's like, we'll put it forward. Alberta Health rejected it. We had to, we had to reapply um, at exactly the one year mark. Um, so there was a lot of hoop jumping. And again, through that, there comes, well, there comes the mental health issues that, you know, that I've touched on through this, the anxiety, the depression, the... Do you uh, ever, did you ever have remorse? Why am I doing this? Because that, like, at the end of the day, that's what I'm trying to not, not get at, but I'm just, I want to ask the question to, to people yeah. who have gone through this is, like, like I said to myself, I always have remorse whenever I do something. Like I have seizures because of my cancer that is pushing up against my brain. And I, I, I think to myself, I can't go to the hospital because I'd be putting people in danger when I'm there and I could be putting myself in danger. So I don't do it. And then three days later, it's like, why didn't I go to the hospital? I could be having my surgery right now. So for you, did you have remorse and go, okay, like I've just gone through 10 months of hormone now the dot AHS is telling me, nope, you have to have a full year. So we have to start this whole process all over again to make sure we do it right at the one year process, one year mark. Like to me, I would just I would be defeated at that time. Uh, there, luckily at this point, um, I wasn't defeated. I was annoyed. I wasn't defeated. <laughs> I was annoyed. I was very annoyed. Um, this is a bit of what, you know, sparked, I guess, you know, within at least the last couple of years, you know, being, you know, outspoken and, and advocating, especially for healthcare, that was kind of what sparked the annoyance um, and looking into anyways. So did I have regrets? Getting into surgery? No. Immediately after surgery, uh, as you said, this should have been, and it was, it was a happy, it was a really weird moment. So I flew back from Montreal because Montreal is where um, surgeries are directed across Canada. If I'm not mistaken, they all go to Montreal. That's where the doctor is. Um, again, I'm pretty sure there's more than just that one doctor in Canada that could do it. But anyways, that's a, a whole other, it's a whole other question. Um, so anyways, went to Montreal, had the surgery, stayed in the, you know, the convalescence home for a week and a bit. Everything seemed fine. Um, there was a bit of pain. There was a bit of issues with the catheter. Um, it had to come out and then be put back in. Sorry for a TMI moment, but that's just the reality of it. Um, which by the way, if anyone has, you know, never had a catheter inserted when you're conscious, it's an experience. I'll give you that. Um, so anyways, so there was a bit of issues with that, but nothing that seemed incredibly abnormal at this point. So they gave me, you know, the pain medication, um, which was a heavy duty narcotic because it's an incredibly invasive surgery that a person just went through. Um, so they gave me the pain medication to last me through the plane ride, as well as for the first couple of days at home until I could see my family doctor. Um, they gave me something to just help with anxiety and nerves, essentially to like help me to sleep throughout the plane ride so that it would just kind of sort of pass and you get on, you take your pain medication, you fall asleep, you get on the plane, essentially to make you comfortable. Um, they gave me my donuts, blah, blah, blah. Landed in Calgary. Great. Get home. I'm at home for less than 24 hours and the pain gets to unmanageable, absolutely unmanageable with what they gave me. Um, there's issues with bleeding. There's issues with discharge. There's issues with dilating, which is the, uh, the, the post-operative 
um, pr procedure that you have to do to, um, to, to help the vaginal cavity stay open um, while you're healing. Um, there was issues with that. It went sideways in less than 24 hours. Um, so I went to, so in an incredible amount of pain in the middle of the night, couldn't get in to see my family doctor, was in so much pain, had all these issues. I'm like, what is, is going on? Um, sorry, Chris, just give me two quick seconds. No worries. Um, okay. What was the last thing I said? You were talking about uh, unmanageable pain. You tried to get into your doctors, your family doctors. You couldn't do that. So you were going to the emergency? Yes. Um, so, yeah, essentially it was... So was in a tremendous amount of pain. So it ended up in emergency. And I would end up in emergency over a dozen times in the course of a couple of weeks because of the complications. What it ended up being, hematomas formed in the area. Um, and so it, it was just, it was quite frankly, um, it, it made my life a living hell for nine months. The pain, I could barely walk without a cane. Um, I couldn't work. So financial troubles, my life was hell. This is when that second most dark time kind of sort of comes into play. And to answer the question, did I have regrets? Yes, because I was in so much pain and my, my body before, even though, to put it frankly, I hated it and I was disconnected from it. If there was something wrong with it, I knew how to respond to it. I knew what to do if there was, like, I knew how to manage it because I had had it for, you know, 20 some odd years. This was all new. It was all foreign. I didn't have a doctor in Calgary that understood. So every time I was going into emergency, I was met with doctors who had no clue what to do. So essentially kind of sort of got, okay, well, let's give you more things to manage the pain but we can't help you. We can't help you with, yeah. you know, dilation and you not being able to maintain your vaginal cavity. So, but we can help you manage the pain. Um, and that's really all they could do. Wow. So here I was, I essentially felt like a failed science experiment. I felt like a botched science experiment. Here is something that I had been looking forward to for so long, what should have been one of the happiest moments, if not the most happiest moment of my life, second to if I get married and if I adopt children, um, but it was hell on earth. So I did, I found myself being like, oh my God, did I make a mistake? Did I make a mistake? is like, if I had a rewind button, I wanted to press rewind. Again, in this period, this is within the first nine months of it, because of the pain, the pain was so unmanageable, unbearable, I couldn't work, I couldn't, I, I had pretty much zero quality of life. I was bedridden almost, I was hobbling over with a cane. It was, I was miserable, I was so miserable. Um, and I did have regrets. I shouldn't mention this right now, just for those who are listening and those who might use what Anna just said out of context. Please don't. I was going to say, don't do it. I will find you. Exactly. She, uh, you seem happy. You seem content. You seem like that well, moment, that dark period yeah. after the surgery has, you've gotten past it. So for those who are about to use that out of context, don't. 
And if you do, no, and do not use this interview out of context because that's the great thing about this show. We have literally the whole thing up for everyone to listen to. If you're going to take it out of context, don't even try. No, and and Chris, and that is, and that's just it. So nine months, let's say a year. Um, it was, it was hell on earth. I, again, was in that dark space. I contemplated um, because I was on an incredibly, incredibly heavy duty narcotic and I had enough of it to, and I was like, I, I can't, I made a mistake. Why is this happening to me? I'm a failed science experiment. Like, why? Why? Um, and as I said, again, if for, for those who wanted to take it out of context, and I already said this earlier, my doctor, I went into my doctor's office the one day and I didn't care. This was literally the day that I had decided that, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I cannot take this anymore. But I'm like, I'll go to my doctor's office. I'll go to my doctor's appointment and then I'll come home and do what I'm going to do. Went into my doctor's appointment. And this was when my doctor, again, extended, extended the hand. And I literally rolled out of bed. And my doctor was like, this is not how you normally come into a doctor's appointment. And I looked at him and I said, eh, just not feeling it. And I was on the, I was on the table and he did, he wheeled himself over and he kind of, you know, sat with his hands in between his, in his, in his legs and bent over and he looked at me and he said, how you doing? And I broke down and I told him everything. I told him, you know, I'm miserable. I'm all of the things. And he said, okay. He's like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get here. We're, we're, he said, I want you to hear me when I promise you we're going to fix this. And we figured it out. Wow. We, so I ended up in, um, so because I was having you know, a bit of, bit of struggles with my mental health. I had a bit of a stay at the Peter Lougheed mental health unit. Um, they were lovely. They were incredible. Um, it was exactly what I needed. And because in addition to helping, you know, manage the acute, you know, the, the mental distress that I was in, they also set me up with a chronic pain nurse while I was there. And the chronic pain nurse prescribed me a medication that I'm still on today. And I kid you not, Chris, it was like overnight. My body started to be like, oh, okay. I'm okay. Like my body, it was like literally my body changed its internal monologue to being like, okay, I'm okay. This is fine. And it adjusted. There are still some there are still some complications as is related to, to dilating, which we're still managing, but the pain is, is gone. It's managed. We've managed the nerve pain. Um, and true to my doctor's word, he fixed it. Like he, he did everything he could. He literally became an expert. Like he walked the journey with me. He became an expert in trans healthcare. And he's a family doctor. Like this was so beyond his scope, but he he did it. He he absolutely did it. And so, again, did I have regrets? Yes, I did. I had regrets that were fueled by. The biggest thing is, is I had prepped for everything. No one had told me about. And here's the thing: the complications that I went through, Chris. It is such a small fraction of patients that experience the type of complications that I have, it's barely on the radar. I mean, obviously I told my doctor that, well, I would have still appreciated if we put it on the radar so I could be prepared. For, like I was prepared for everything, Chris. Like I literally was like, oh my God, what if I die on the operating table? Like I was literally prepared for almost everything. And then this one, it was like a curveball, And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck to do with this. I have no idea. Where did this come from? Yeah. No one told me about this. I was not, this was, no one put this in my, so 
and I did talk to my doctor about that. I've talked to my um, psychologist who is, you know, one of the only three people who practice. I've told him that I'm like, here's the thing going forward. Maybe, maybe mention this to folks, just give them a heads up, give them a head. That's all I'm saying. Just give them a heads up. Even if it's um, 1%, you still need to tell people about that 1% well, of patients. That's who the thing. Have- it's like, it's like 0.0. Like it's such a, it's so small. It's so small. It's like that one in a million. I, I mean, my last name's Murphy. So if I didn't have a, if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all, as they say. So yes, I did have regrets, but they were regrets fueled by pain and just what was going on. But again, I was lucky enough. I don't know what the outcome might have been. Um, I'm not saying like, you know, self-harm or anything, but I look at what if I was in rural Alberta where maybe I didn't have as affirming of a doctor. Maybe I would have detransitioned or, or, or whatever, you know, one wants to call it. I, I can't speak to that. It's yeah. possible, but I was fortunate to be in a place where my doctor grabbed the bull by the horns and said, I'm going to fix you. I am going to give you care. I'm not going to let, like, we're going to, we're going to figure this out. So like huge kudos to my doctor. Cause we did. And I have, I have no regrets, zero regrets. I did. I don't. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. That's awesome. Um, I want to talk about one last area and then we'll wrap up here, Anna. And that's be that is the last few years. Post gender affirm affirmation, affirming surgery. There you go. Affirming surgery. There you go. Yep. Now this is gonna be where I really get the anger, angry messages. Dating. <laughs> Yes. Okay. All right. I, I because I, I, I honestly, I, I, I have so many questions that I, 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 that that's why I had to do a full week, not just one day, because I, I, this is one of those I have things. questions too. If well, I find a husband, if I find a husband out of this, I'm like, cool. You're going to be, you're going to be my favorite. There you, Hey, there you go. We will leave her Twitter feed up on the show notes. So please <laughs> check it out. Um, Alberta is traditionally not a progressive city, sorry, a, a province. Um, what is life like in the relationship world as a transgendered woman, as a woman in this day of age? Because while we can say we are more progressive, we have just elected our first woman mayor. We Hell yes, we did. She's there you go. Yes, I um, love her. We... We 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 have a there we had a female pre two female premiers we had a Muslim mayor before that a Punjabi mayor in Edmonton, but there still is the stereotype that different is bad. Mm-hmm. I I'm a gay man. I am uh, I am an interracial couple uh, in the re- interracial couple, and people still look at us. Like we're doing something wrong. They're okay with the gay thing. They're just not okay with the interracial gay thing. And that's, it still blows my mind. But anyway, we still get hate mail about it. But what is it like to live in a city that is quote unquote progressive somewhat, but still have trouble being yourself in some ways? Oh, well, um, that's a million dollar I, question. And I apologize for the rambling there because I don't know how to properly word that statement. So hopefully you can decipher what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> I mean, 
well, dating is, well, in regards to dating and all of that, I have essentially gotten to a point where some women don't get to have it all. Um, I've essentially resigned myself to the fact that Prince Charming probably most likely isn't out there for me. Not because I don't want him to be, but just the reality of it. There was a, there was an article actually um, uh, fairly recently within the last couple of years that literally the percentage of trans women who have found success in dating or marriage, you know, like, and again, this is primarily trans women who are straight for all intents and purposes. So trans women who are attracted to men, um, the, the percentage of them that this study essentially did, it's so minuscule that it pretty much says that, yeah, it might be out there, but here's the thing. And this is the other thing. I don't need viewers I don't need friends who may be watching this to reach out and tell me, you'll find someone. There's someone out there for you. Please don't. Please don't. Please, dear God, don't. I know you're trying to be helpful. It's not helpful, actually. It's it's frustrating because the thing with dating as a trans woman is men can't or not that they can't, but they have a really hard time uh removing the reality of i am not a man i'm a woman i am physically a woman in per in every aspect possible um but they have this idea that somehow if they date a trans woman that they are gay and it's like you're not you're not gay because you're not dating a guy you're dating a woman you're a guy dating a woman congratulations you're still straight um now i mean i can't i mean so if... so i apologize to interrupt because i gotta ask the question because now we're getting into the part of the conversation where i'm gonna interrupt a lot because you, you're gonna say stuff that i need to know the que answers to so when you're if you're searching for a, a, a date a perspective male of companionship do you openly say you're a trans female or do you say you're a female because yet again I'm going to ask the inappropriate questions now because this is the part of the, the, the conversation where I'm literally at a loss for words and I don't know the correct answers. So I need to know. So when you when you're talking to people or when you're going out for a job interview or when you're even like, I didn't know you were trans until you told me you were. I That's was like, kind of oh. That's kind of the point. Okay. <laughs> so That's I got to ask. Exactly. But I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be like oblivious and people, I'm going to get hate mail. Well, how did you not know? Do you not watch the social media feeds? Yes, I do. But I don't make assumptions. When you say you're a woman, I, you're a woman to me. Hmm. <laughs> There's my I, rant for the day. I apologize, but continue I on. <laughs> I appreciate that rant. Um, you know, Chris, I, uh, I tried to, you know, I, I, I did it both ways. So when I first started exploring the dating world, I didn't put it in my dating profile because I was of the mind. I still am, but there was an experience that changed a bit of this. But anyways, I was of the mind. I still am that, you know, my future boyfriend, my future husband, spouse should love me for me. Like at the end of the day, they should get to know Anna and fall in love with who I am as a person and me putting transgender, that was the, like, they wouldn't even go past that. Like, that was it. Like, the, there wasn't even a hello, hi, how are you? You know, like, there was nothing. Zip. Um, and then an incident um, occurred where uh, I did end up having a date with a guy um, it was shortly after I moved to Calgary, actually. He was a firefighter visiting from Edmonton. And 
I hadn't disclosed that I was trans, a trans woman. And we ended up uh, having, we were at my place, we were having coffee and just chatting. It was a Sunday morning. Um, it was during Chasing Summer. He was down for Chasing Summer. And when he essentially found out that I was a trans woman, um, it angered him. And as a result, um, he assaulted me physically and sexually. And it was after that, and I knew that it was a risk that trans women faced in the dating world. Um, I thought I was safe with a firefighter, um, someone who is in a position of trust, um, lulled me into a false sense of security. So anyways, after that incident, um, I put it on my profile. Um, but also I put it on my profile because I want to be honest with my, you know, future, you know, partner. Um, I want them to know me, all of me. And also really, I mean, I don't, now I probably don't even need to put it on there because really I'm sure if they, you know, scrolled briefly through my Instagram or Twitter, or my public Facebook profile, they would probably put two and two together. They would probably come and draw their own conclusion. Um, but regardless, I keep it there um, because I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm trans. Like if you wanna have a conversation about that, a respectful conversation about that, which really watch this interview, there's the conversation. Um, like, I, Thank you, Chris. This is actually going to be great. I might just post this interview in my dating profile and be like, here you go. Like, just watch. Watch afterwards. Like, let's get into the, I don't know. Like, I... It's, I, it's, I I'm going to interrupt for one more second. And I go for it. For this. So, As a former firefighter... Yes. Oh, pardon me? Oh, I said short answer is yes, Chris. I do put it on my profile that I'm trans. As, as a former firefighter, as someone who has helped many people out, I am ashamed and disturbed that someone in that position, in that power would ever do something like that. And um, I, I hope you do not paint a broad brush stroke with all firefighters because we, there are some good ones out there and there's some bad ones, just like there's some good, good politicians and bad politicians. Sean Chu. <laughs> you said it. I did. I, I just coughed. I just coughed. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I heard nothing. Exactly. Um, but no, I, I definitely don't. Um, this was, I mean, that, particular instance was just another moment where it pointed out the the flaws in our system when it comes to reporting rape and assault and and all of that and how that whole thing goes about this was also you know again this was a bit this was right at the me too anyways doesn't really matter it 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 more was a front row seats not really that I wanted but it it showed and highlighted to me where our system is broken in in a lot of ways when it comes to that um do you feel safe in the city of Calgary I do feel safe in in the city of Calgary um and not do you feel like you can be yourself in the city of Calgary I, Yes, I would. Yeah, I would say wholeheartedly. Yes. Calgary has to borrow from the newly uh, elected mayor elect, Jyoti Gondek. Calgary's given me opportunity. And that's one of the reasons why I, yeah, anyways, why I admire our new mayor is another podcast entirely, but Calgary really did provide me opportunity. Calgary is where I flourished 
mostly. Um, and Calgary has, oh, for the most part, welcomed me with open arms. Calgary's where, Calgary's where I wore high heels for the first time. Calgary's where I went on my first date. Um, Calgary is where I found my voice. Um, Calgary is home. I mean, I'm born and raised in Alberta, but Calgary is home. Like, you know that a place is your home when you leave it and you can't wait to get back to it. And that's me. You know, when I see the bow building approaching on the skyline or on the horizon, when I'm driving, you know, when I've driven back either from Edmonton or Medicine Hat or wherever it is, and you start to see the outline of the bow on the horizon, it's like, oh, I'm almost home. And then you get into view of the skyline and you're, I live down, you know, down in, in the inner city. And it just, Calgary's home and I, I don't fear, you know, walking out, but then I also have a, a certain level of, of privilege. I, you know, in my own opinion, am passable. I have undergone surgery. I, you know, am like, I, I have a certain level of privilege that others don't. So I can recognize those gender diverse individuals who don't feel and don't get that experience, excuse me, who don't get that experience in Calgary. And it breaks my heart because I know that we're so much better than the ignorance and the intolerance that some folks would hope to embolden and empower. That's not our Calgary. It's not my Calgary. And so, yes, I do feel safe in Calgary. I feel safe in Calgary to the point where, you know, tonight it's, you know, I'm, I'm down um, just outside of City Hall at Be The Change. Actually, I was doing some, some volunteering. I'm going to be heading home after this. I'll probably end up going past the safe consumption site through, you know, Central Memorial. I don't feel scared. I don't feel this fear that some would hope to have people feel. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist there. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist here, rather. Um, but this is my home. And I love my home. And I feel safe in my home. But I do and again, for anyone listening to this being like, ah, well, that's not my experience. I recognize that. And that's why we can't stop fighting and advocating and speaking out for ensuring that every, every corner of this city and every corner of this province is a safe and affirming space for trans, gender diverse, two-spirit individuals. Because I might feel safe, but there are lots of those who don't feel safe and don't feel welcome. Those are who we need to ensure that we keep fighting for. My last question to you, Anna, is this. We have spent the last hour and 45 minutes talking. What is one thing, if we could, if you could talk to every and I'm, I'm not, I do not want to paint a broad brushstroke right now, but I'm going to. Every bully, every person who attacked you, every person who had said something negative to you over the last, over your lifetime, if you could have a moment with them and say one thing to them, what would that be? Look at me now. Um, in the words of, there's a song by Toby Keith. And while I'm not exactly a huge fan of Toby Keith, the individual, um, oh, <laughs> the, the, the individual, not a huge fan, the music, uh, you're up with it. Um, but yeah, how do you like me now? Um, again, that's not to say that I have it all together and, and everything is sunshine and roses. It's not, it's life, but no, honestly, look at me now, you know, I just got done having the remarkable 
privilege of a lifetime getting to watch as you know her worship Marilette Jyoti Gondek got elected and watching her and her team and the passion they have for this city like wow like that was had a front row seat to observing history being made um I have been able to sit down for you know incredible conversations with you know the honorable uh, member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood, Janice Irwin, where we've chatted about trans health care, got to sit in the ledge and, and watch question periods uh, when, you know, uh, leader of the opposition, Rachel Notley, got kicked out of the house for standing up and, you know, speaking the truth, have gotten to meet so many incredible people through my volunteering and, and advocacy. So look at me now look at me now. Um, there was a 10 year high school reunion that I was supposed to be at. Unfortunately, there was well, actually, fortunately, there was a municipal election going on, I couldn't attend. I'm not exactly heartbroken. I, I hold your sympathies about going back to high school. I, I, when you know, high school wasn't, I mean, the, the like the last couple of years of high school weren't terrible. I got to graduate from a high school where my grandmother was an administrator. My dad graduated. It was pretty cool. My last year of high school was not incredibly the absolute worst, but at the same time, it was still pretty dang lonely. It was. Um, Anna, I want to thank you. This is the first episode of a week long series about trans issues. And I know that I've probably only scratched the surface on trans issues in Alberta, in Canada, but also just trans issues in general. And I want, I want to thank you for being open, honest, vulnerable, and willing to talk about these things because I hear all the time on social media, we need to give places and voices the uh, platforms to say these things. And I hope this week people will tune in and learn something, but also just take something away that they didn't beforehand. Because I can tell you in the last hour and 45 minutes, I've taken away a lot. And I look forward to our budding friendship growing in the next few years as well, because I think uh, when this lockdown is over, or if you want to socially distance in the backyard in the freezing cold, I have a backyard wa waiting for you to come on over and Ricardo would probably be happy to see you as well. Heck yes. Heck yes. And thank you so much for, for having me on. Um, I look forward to hopefully finding love as a result. I mean, you gave me a, you gave me a, gave me a plug for, for, for dating. Um, <laughs> Come on people. Come on. <laughs> Men of Alberta, Australia, Ireland, Germany, for some reason, we I'll have a it. woman who's looking for love. Let's do it. <laughs> um, Bach bachelor in the prairies. Here we go. Bachelorettes in the prairies. Yes. Um, for everyone who's tuned in before, you know the saying. Uh, the links in the show notes are of Anna's Twitter and social media, Instagram, if that's okay with you to put that out there. Uh, Follower. Yeah. It is a great experience. I have uh, I've just been doing it recently. And uh, when I put this out, I was impressed that she reached out and said she wanted to do this. So here we are. You never know what happens when you put good things out in the world. You might find a man. <laughs> there you, you might, go. Um, you might find a man. You might change the world. Who knows? There you Maybe. go. With that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. We will be back tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, with another great episode. If you want to, follow us along on social media and Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all those fun things. But also, if you want to back the show, consider donating two, three dollars or a monthly donation. It's always greatly appreciated. Anyway, from everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, keep talking and enjoy the rest of your day and see you back here at eight o'clock. <laughs>